Good morning, everyone. It is day 12 of our habit formation series. Uh, I missed yesterday just because it was Saturday and I was working elsewhere and pretty exhausted, but I did notice a couple things. And most of behavior change comes down to noticing emerging patterns in your brain and picking out those extremely small processes that go around, floating around in your brain or in your biology right after that cue has taken place. So right after you feel that urge to go back into the, the old habit, the circumstances you're in, um, how you feel, any related triggering emotions or associations, uh, sensory perceptions, all those things. More data is always better and it's the accumulation of data that helps you helps everyone usually um, hone better strategies to actually making that habit change. I found a cool poem that I wanted to share with you, just that would become more useful on the opposite side once you've actually succeeded in creating a new habit. And it's, I'll read it briefly, just the first line. So nothing is easier than to imagine how when a current once has transversed a path, it should transverse it more readily still a second time. But what made it ever transverse the first time? And that just reminds me that once you've actually built the new habit, it's ingrained and it doesn't feel like it took a ton of effort to do. But when you're in the process, it takes a lot of effort and it feels messy and forced. The analogy to that would just be current in the example would just be, think of a stream carving a new path out of rock or a stream bed or something. It's only an initial trickle that starts and then once more and more momentum builds up behind it, forms an entirely new path, and then eventually the water gets to pick which path is easier. And eventually it'll completely reroute. The old path will dry up or have maybe dampness in it. But it's hard to imagine that the same force flow through the old path sometimes. So that's on the other side. So we have to look forward to that. But I just wanted to give you a couple of things that I noticed and some strategies I'm gonna start implementing for myself. And it's perfectly okay to change strategy when you're building new habits. It's, as you determine more and more excuses you make or um, motivations that are hidden below the addiction, you can definitely change things just to help you reach the outcome. It doesn't matter how you get there, unless it's more destructive, obviously, but just so you get there. So what I noticed is, for me, negative repercussions are far greater motivator than positive uh, reward, which we do need and we'll go over. But for the coffee thing, I've noticed that my teeth are actually getting stained. And this was brought up by my dentist last visit. And I noticed it obviously, but you can erase that, but it's a serious cosmetic thing for me. So it, there's a great incentive to stop drinking staining products like coffee and even tea, black tea more so, which is closest to coffee. But that's almost a bigger motivator because it's a visceral reminder rather than a biological internal tick that I just angry at myself about. That's a visceral reminder that you're still doing it because you will see improvement if you stop constantly staining your teeth. So the negative for me is almost as much as the positive. I did find another article that I wanted to go over with you uh, briefly. We'll split this up into multiple sections because it's a big article, but it's from uh, brainpost.co uh, and uh, I'll pull it up here on screen. The section that I want to go over just briefly is just the amount of physical parts of the brain involved in uh, goal-directed behaviors and uh, action outcomes and reinforcement habits. But the uh, cortex and the basal ganglia are the part that it is. this article is focusing on, and those are pretty strong components of the brain. Cortex obviously is associated with all that higher level 
cognition, all of that executive management of the brain, the the watching or the the director, the um, piece of your brain that ties all of the other deeper, faster, more primal circuitry together. And the basal ganglia, as they describe, is um, important for selecting a movement for a particular situation. So that's the part that is going to allow you to choose which pathway to go down. And this goes into all from cue signals to um, dorsolateral stratum, uh, chunking of tasks, all that. We'll go over that in the next video because it's a little more complicated. But the thing this article brings up that I want to go over is reward. Um, so obviously accomplishing something is rewarding, but what we haven't talked about yet is the fact that we need to reward ourselves for accomplishing the new pattern we're trying to build. If you're do picking something such as being more physically active, going to the gym, eating better, usually the reward is just the positive feeling you get, not from internally succeeding, but from the actual activity. So if you're going to the gym, you will feel a rush of endorphins and blood flow and everything. Your body will just feel better after you go to the gym. That in itself can be a reward because there's a ton of positive neurotransmitters associated with that. But if it's something more delicate, such as stimulants or coffee, the the negative habit, drinking of the coffee for me, is going to give you those rewards. So I get that rush of energy, that burst of energy, and that is a negative feedback loop in my case, or it'd be positive feedback loop, because I'm rewarded for the negative behavior with that feeling. But it turns into a negative behavior if I start getting side effects of that. So if I get jittery or if I can't sleep. So there's a there's a balance there, but I realize I need to focus on a more rewarding behavior for the for cutting the stimulant out. So I think I'm actually going to swap up my time of day. Um, I really don't need coffee in the morning and it doesn't serve as much of a purpose that um, that tea that I introduced last video, the Ticino, the maca and chocolate, is pretty close. I think I am just going to, as I did this morning, put it in my Yeti, put a little sweetener in it, some maple syrup or honey, and just drink that in the morning instead of coffee. I really don't have that craving. It hit me in the morning as hard as I do in the afternoon. In the afternoon is where I get really twitchy because I start going to the gym and there's a built-in mechanism in me that <laughs> I'm afraid that I won't be able to get as good of a workout if I'm not stimulated. That's definitely false because there's plenty of people that don't use stimulants and go to the gym. If your sleep schedule's on track, if your nutrition's on track, you don't need stimulants to lift heavy at the gym or have a great workout. But that's the addiction talking. So I think what I'm going to do, see how this works for a couple days, is just do the tea in the morning and then about an hour and a half to an hour before I go to the gym, I will do a cup of coffee. And this will do a couple things. A, it'll actually give me some energy to go to the gym. And then my reward for only doing that in the afternoon, or just my reward for obeying my goal, will be a great gym workout. And that'll also burn the caffeine off. So that should balance each other out. And then all those positive um, endorphins, neurotransmitters, blood flow, flooding your body will be a reward for associating the caffeine directly before a workout. Using it as a tool, it's still technically a crutch at that point, but it's way more of a tool than just having it in the morning when I don't need it. Uh, so hopefully that'll build those positive neurological associations in my brain. We'll see how that works. And as I said, there's no harm in constantly tweaking strategy, uh, figuring out what comes up in your brain. And this whole exercise reminds me a lot of meditation. Uh, so I haven't been doing regular breath work since I've just been so busy, which isn't a great excuse, since that's when you should be doing regular breath work to level yourself out and bring those stress levels down. But the amount of watching yourself in your brain involved in habit formation just to collect data about processes and micro cues is almost identical to meditation. 
if you were sitting for 20 minutes and focusing on your breath and just watching what comes up in your brain, uh, things that float by, daily tasks, to-do lists, uh, anxieties, things like that. If you've ever done that in the past, it is extremely useful to do that for building habits just because the same things come up in your brain. You'll see excuse, excuse, um, internal motivation, uh, I won't get as good of a workout, uh, I won't feel as good, I uh, need to be amped, uh, can't do it without it, um, why not? It's There's so many little things that come up in your brain and just notice all those, write them down if you could. I always carry a notepad because I just don't like talking into a phone to record myself because I don't like the way my voice sounds. So I always tend to write these things down. It's very useful to go back over later. Uh, and in a future series, we'll do a, a series on breath work because I, I do enjoy diving into that. And I find that it's easier for me to do in a chunk. So as a project, so I'll do a three week deep dive or something. We'll go over that in another series, but we'll do more of this article later. Just wanted to go over the what I had noticed popping up in my brain. And uh, if you guys want, let me know if you're doing any habit formation in the comments below or reach out on my social media and be interested to know what everyone is working on in the new year. Until next time.